Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Hampel, and I'm one of the canons of St. Paul's. Welcome to St. Paul's and uh, to this rather happy problem that we have, which is that the combination, I think, of our very excellent uh, guest speaker, Professor McGrath, and his subject, C.S. Lewis, of course, has drawn people to us in great numbers, which is very wonderful. But it does mean that I regret that some of you might be a little bit uncomfortable, but do feel free to sit on the floor where you are if that helps. You'll still be able to hear um, and do feel uh, warmly welcome whether you have a chair or not. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Professor McGrath, as many of you know, is Professor of Theology, Ministry and Education at King's College just along the road from here and also head of its Centre for Theology, Religion and Culture. He's one of our most distinguished theologians and has published numerous academic and theological books including the best-selling The Dawkins Delusion, and indeed in his new biography of C.S. Lewis, in describing Lewis's journey from atheism uh, to Christianity, he includes a precy of his critique of people like Dawkins uh, in the postscript to the biography. So he's turned his formidable attention to the extraordinary figure of C.S. Lewis, the Oxford Don who wrote the Narnia books, which have been so much loved by generation after generation of children, and who became an unlikely public prophet of Christianity and whose influence is still very much with us 50 years after his death. And what's particularly interesting about the book which Professor McGrath is going to talk about today is that he has been able to study uh, all of Lewis's letters papers and publications in the order in which he wrote them, and that's partly due to the excellent scholarship of Walter Hooper, who over the last few years has made available all of Lewis's papers in this way. And as a result, uh, particularly for those of us who've read other biographies of Lewis, there are some very uh, fascinating moments of revelation uh, in the story of Lewis as Professor McGrath has presented it to us, and it's a great privilege having read it, to feel that one is present uh, at these moments of revelation, particularly in relation to the chronology uh, of Lewis's uh, move from uh, atheism to faith. And so we're very grateful to Professor McGrath for what he's given us. And would you now please welcome him, our speaker today. Well, let me begin by saying what well, a pleasure it is to be here, to be able to speak on C.S. Lewis here at St. Paul's. And let, let me apologize to those of you who are standing. As, as a mark of solidarity, I'll stand as well. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk a bit about this biography of C.S. Lewis. Now, I want to talk to you about why Lewis is so interesting, some of the things that I found out about Lewis, and then just try and open up why we keep reading Lewis and what we can expect to find. I guess many of you will say, well, look, you know, Lewis has attracted a lot of biographers. I mean, why a new biography? Why not just leave things alone? There's enough out there already. I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. But it seemed to me that this is 2013. We're marking the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death in November. And Lewis's books continue to sell very, very strongly. Indeed, they sell more strongly today than during his lifetime. So it's quite clear that Lewis is saying something that still resonates with people, and he's saying it in a way that resonates even more with people. And so it seemed to very, very appropriate to mark the anniversary of Lewis's death by trying to paint him as accurately as possible. I think that's been made more, more easy, if I may say so, by uh, some of the points that was being mentioned a moment ago. For example, Walter Hooper's excellent editorial work. We now have all of Lewis's letters available, and indeed, they form the narrative backbone of this biography. So why a new biography? Well, I think the first thing to stress is there's been a huge amount of scholarly work on Lewis, even in the last 10 years. Uh, in the past, Lewis was read by his admirers. More recently, he's come to be read by scholars who are also, but not always, his admirers. And so I think there's a huge body of literature that really needed to be distilled and summarized. And this book tries to do this, although, of course, it's trying to tell a story, not to get bogged down in conceptual analysis. But also, in preparing for this, this took me about four and a half years to write, 
I decided to read everything Lewis wrote and published in chronological order, which took, I have to say, 15 months. I think that I originally did that because I thought this will help me understand how Lewis's writing style developed, it'll help me understand how his thought developed, and also, as every author knows, it might give me some good quotes I could kind of weave into the text of the biography. And in doing that, I came up with some things which I think moved us into new direct directions. Why should I write a biography of Lewis? After all, there are many others who might seem better qualified to do that. I think that's a fair question. So let me just put out some points that I think um, are important here. First of all, I, I, I began to read Lewis in 1974, three years after I myself discovered Christianity. And Lewis wasn't involved in my conversion at all. But as I began to think through my faith, I found in Lewis a robust and interesting and engaging voice, which really interested me. And I kept on reading him. And I have to say that when you go back and reread Lewis, you very often find things you missed out the first time round. But Lewis and I both grew up in Northern Ireland, in the city of Belfast. And I know so many of the places that Lewis talks about in his letters, in his books, and so on. And also, of course, both of us went up to Oxford University. As it happens, we both went up as atheists, both discovered Christianity at Oxford. And of course, we also both ended up being Oxford Dons. I think that is helpful. One of the things this biography tries to do is to talk about Lewis as an Irishman. That side of things is very often neglected. Lewis as an Irishman in England was slightly on the periphery of things. And indeed, that's reflected in the subtitle, eccentric genius. Not that Lewis was mad, but rather that he stood displaced from the center of things. For example, in Oxford academic culture in the 1940s, Lewis really did come to be a bit on the margins, not because his scholarship was bad, but because other academics disliked his popular success, for example, through the screw tape letters. But also, of course, even in the church, where Lewis played a very significant role as a public advocate of the Christian faith, he was always writing, as he kept on emphasizing, as a layman of the Church of England. Not from its center, he never cultivated the establishment, but rather simply as an ordinary layman writing for primarily ordinary lay people. So what sort of things do we find in this biography? Well, let me begin by telling you who I wrote this biography for, because I think that is an important point to make. This biography really is written for someone who has perhaps read the Narnia books or seen the Narnia movies and says, I'd like to know more about this man. Now, obviously, there'll be many who know a lot about Lewis from other sources, but there is a growing contingent of people who've discovered Lewis through Narnia, through the movies. And therefore, it seemed right to begin to speak to them and try and answer some of the questions that they would want answered. And this does help explain the structure of the book. Most biographies of Lewis are year by year. You know, this year this happened, this year this happened, so on. And it makes it very easy to follow what's happening in Lewis's life. But the difficulty about this is if you're saying Narnia really matters, well, you know, Narnia's genesis and writing is spread out over quite an extended period of time. And if you do it on a year-by-year -year basis, you cannot really focus on how Narnia came into being, the writing process, and begin to engage with what it is about Narnia that so engages and interests people. So in effect, I organized this book on the principle we will look at the worlds that Lewis inhabited real and imagined. And so there's a very long section on Oxford, there's a shorter section in Cambridge, and between them there's a section on Narnia. And that is really designed to help those who are interested in that specific aspect of Lewis's thought to really get the most out of it. Now obviously there's a huge amount of academic work underlying this biography, but I postponed a lot of that to a more rigorous academic book, which is published actually about the same time as the biography, called The Intellectual World of C.S. Lewis. Because if, if you're telling a story of somebody's life, and then you pause and say, now let's have 9,000 words on Lewis's imagery of light. 
you know, I'm going to lose my audience. So in many ways, I decided to keep the story going and postpone more academic discussion to a different kind of book. So what sort of things are new in this biography? Well, the answer is there are lots, but I'm going to mention two very briefly. I did a huge amount of archive work, very often turning up stuff for the very first time, and one of those concerns a question that I found myself baffled by in looking at Lewis's career. As many of you will know, Lewis joined the British Army. He was sent to fight in northwestern France, and the regiment he joined was the Somerset Light Infantry. And most biographies just take this as the most obvious thing in the world. You know, he joined the Somerset Light Infantry. And, of course, uh, some of you may be from Somerset, and it's a very nice place. But that doesn't help us understand why Lewis would join the Somerset Light Infantry. He trained for the military in Oxford. He came from Belfast. There is no connection with Somerset. Lewis formed a very close friendship when in training at Oxford with Paddy Moore, whose mother plays a very important role in Lewis's career, as you will all know. Paddy Moore joined the Rifle Brigade and was unfortunately killed in the Somme in March 1918. When researching the archives of one Oxford college that housed the training unit in which both Lewis and Moore were based, I came across something very interesting. Each officer cadet is identified by the sponsoring regiment, which of course was a regiment they'd be expected to join, but if they asked to go somewhere else they could, or if they showed skills that meant they would be better deployed in some other capacity, then it meant they would do something else. Lewis was originally sponsored by the King's own Scottish borderers and joined the Somerset Light Infantry. And beside Paddy Moore's name, I found the name of his sponsoring regiment, the Somerset Light Infantry. Makes perfect sense. Moore came from Bristol, and for military recruitment purposes, that part of Bristol is in the county of Somerset. It looks as if Lewis joined that regiment on the expectation he and his best friend would go into battle together. But Paddy Moore was reassigned at the last moment. So Lewis went into battle on his own. I think that's quite poignant. And there are lots of little examples like that where you cast light on things that are not you know, very exciting or dramatic, but nevertheless give you a fuller picture of what is actually going on. But I think one of the big sections of my book, which I need to talk about a little bit, looks at this very important question. When did Lewis begin to believe in God? Now, as many of you will know, this trajectory is quite complicated. He begins as a quite aggressive atheist. He begins to believe in God at a quite definite point. And then, over a period of perhaps a year or two, moves from just a generic belief in God to specifically believing in Christianity. In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis talks about getting down, kneeling and praying, the most dejected convert in all England, in the Trinity term of 1929. And I have to tell you that I, I'm probably on my own here, but I don't think that date is right. And reading Lewis's letters, reading other writings that appeared very carefully, makes me think Lewis converted to believing in God a year later. Why? Well, first of all, let me make the point that Lewis, in Surprise by Joy, is just a little careless about dates. Uh, for example, he's a year out in the dating of one particular event, he's eight months out in another, so we need to just work on the assumption there may be other errors as well. Lewis, he later wrote himself, was no good with dates. In 1941, Lewis became the vice president of Magdalen College, Oxford. It's a sort of honorific role. One of its roles was to arrange for the booking of rooms. And this involved taking detailed notes about which room was being used by which person at which time. And it was chaotic. Rooms, if they were booked at all, were very often double booked. And it was sort of just an indication that Lewis may have been brilliant at writing novels, but when it came to you know, more humdrum matters, wasn't quite so good. So I want to just raise the question that maybe Lewis wasn't quite as good about keeping dates as you and I would like. Remember, Surprised by Joy is written in the 1950s. But more seriously, 
Let's look at two things that I think are really important. First of all, Lewis's father died in September 1929. If Lewis's own chronology is right, he would have been a believer in God by that time. And that would have given him a framework with which to approach the death of his father. There is no hint of the impact of belief in God on Lewis's reaction to his father's death in his correspondence around that time. That struck me as being surprising, and it really struck me as being interesting because another possibility might be that the death of Lewis's father was not so much something he interpreted in the light of an existing belief in God, but might be something that triggered off a process of reflection leading to belief in God, which therefore lies ahead of him. So I think that is a very important point to make. But much more important is this, that Lewis's writings show a change in tone in the middle of 1930. It's a very difficult thing to describe. It's a subjective impression, making me think that something has clearly happened. And I can identify two landmarks that clearly bracket off an, a period of several months during which he must have converted to theism. One of them is a landmark from February 1930, in which he writes to one of his best friends, Owen Barfield. I says to Barfield something like this, you better come and see me quickly. The absolute is, is coming in on me. You know, if you don't come and see me immediately, I'm going to end up in a monastery. <laughs> it's a very curious letter because the language that Lewis uses resonates very strongly with his description of the advance of God in Surprised by Joy. But if Lewis converted, you know, nine months earlier, What's all that about? And then a very important point is this. Lewis talks about the need to fly the flag. And he says, when I began to believe in God, I began to go to College Chapel, that's Morton College Chapel, and I began to go to my local parish church. That's Holy Trinity Headington. Holy Trinity Headington does not have good enough records to help us here. But happily, Lewis wrote lots of letters. And in October 1930, 1930, Lewis writes to his best friend, Arthur Greaves, saying, by the way, I have started going to bed earlier in the evenings because I now get up to go to chapel at eight. Now, that is an outward indication of some inward change. And so what I'm suggesting is that something seems to be happening with effect from February 1930 and seems to have happened by October 1930, and that means a displacement of dates. If there is a date, it's sometime in Trinity term, 1930, and I personally think it's probably June. That's the best I can do. But what I want to say to you is this. This, this isn't actually a big deal. Uh, the really important thing is simply that Lewis misremembers how his very significant experiences are to be placed on a map of dates and times. His descriptions of the mental processes, the emotional feelings he was experiencing throughout his conversion make perfect sense. And I began to gain the impression that maybe Lewis really was someone who uh, remembered what he was thinking, remembered what he was experiencing, even though he didn't always correlate it with what was happening in the world around him. So that is the big point of the biography in terms of suggesting changes in our existing understanding of Lewis. There are others, but I'm not going to talk about those because I want to talk about Lewis. And above all, I think, I want to talk about Narnia. And I think the point I want to emphasize here is that it is, it is really very interesting that we are still reading Lewis today. When I was writing this biography, uh, one of the things I was looking at was the development of the friendship between C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. It begins in the late 1920s. And they talk about meeting each other up. Lewis very often would host Tolkien on Monday mornings. They would talk about Nordic myths. They would talk about sagas. They would talk about mythology. 
And the thing that really struck me was this. From our perspective, looking back, these are two giants of English literature who are discussing the projects that will make their names. But recognition lay at least 15 or 20 years away. So in effect, you, you just sense you're in on the beginning of something very big, and neither Lewis nor Tolkien has the slightest sense that this is going to become so important. Many of you will, will probably know this, but for those of you who don't, uh, Tolkien was working on the book that would later become The Lord of the Rings. And he became bogged down, he became discouraged. And Lewis, he wrote, Tolkien wrote later, for a long time was my only audience. And Lewis's key role was to keep Tolkien going. He was the midwife to the Lord of the Rings. But Lewis himself, when he drew close to his own death in 1963, made it very clear to people like Walter Hooper, he didn't really expect to remember it at all. Give them five years and he would be fading from public memory. And one of the more astonishing aspects of Lewis's career is the bounce back. Why did Lewis, who was fading in the late 1960s, early 1970s, bounce back so spectacularly in the 1980s? So that today, we, we just assume everybody always liked C.S. Lewis. For a while, it looked as if he was going to submerge, be forgotten, and that would be the end of it. But it didn't happen. And in the final chapter of the book, I try to explain why and how Lewis began to re-emerge as so significant. And part of the answer is Narnia. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, if I may. This project seems to me to have begun in 1939. Uh, a long time before the books were written or published, but Lewis seems to have begun to, begun to explore the idea that writing novels, writing children's stories, was an extremely powerful and neglected way of opening up very important questions. And we can see him kicking these ideas around. He's helped, uh, I've no doubt, by Tolkien, but in many ways the ideas are his own. And he's beginning to explore how the telling of stories, the engagement of the imagination, is able to hit us at a level that is deeper than reason. What I mean by that is not that Lewis is being irrational. He's simply saying that, that reason has its limits and that the telling of a very powerful, imaginatively engaging story very often gives us new ways of thinking about things and new ways of looking at things. And what I think we need to understand is that behind Narnia really lies this realization of the immensely important role of stories in shaping our understanding of reality and our own place within it. And what Lewis does in the Chronicles of Narnia is to tell a story, or more accurately, a series of interlocking stories, which gives us ways of thinking, ways of looking at things, which resonate with some of our deepest intuitions. Intuitions like, there is a bigger picture of what we're all about. That there is something deeper than what we observe, which helps us to make sense of who we are and this world in which we're placed. And Lewis, in many ways, is opening up ways of thinking and seeing things, which invite us to go deeper. And that, I think, is a very important point, which helps us to understand what this is all about. Lewis uses the image of opening a door. There's a world beyond. It's a world we can inhabit. And once we're in that world, we look back on our own and see our own in a different way. Now, those of you who've read The Pilgrim's Regress, a quite difficult book, the first book Lewis ever wrote, really describing the dynamics of his own conversion, the regress is where the pilgrim, who of course is Lewis, discovers God and then walks back on the same road, but now sees things in a different way. In other words, conversion, transformation, gives you a way of reconceptualizing, re-envisaging your own world. 
And that, I think, is a key theme about Narnia. It helps you to see this world in a different way. And certainly that's one of the things we see in common between Lewis and Tolkien. In both their major works, they are trying to give us a new way of seeing our own world, which somehow seems to make more sense in the light of these stories of the Lord of the Rings or of Narnia. So I think there's a very important point to make here, and it's this. If you read The Lord of the Rings, it's all about a mastering, which is so dangerous, so entrancing, it has to be found and destroyed. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis is talking about a master story, a story which makes sense of all other stories. And once you find it, you don't destroy it, you embrace it because you realize this makes sense of me, this makes sense of the world, this is a story within which I can live and which helps me to make sense of things. And so we shouldn't be surprised, I think, that one of the great themes, especially in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, is this. Which story do I trust? Which story do I trust? Those who've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, just think yourselves into the story or the film. What is Narnia? Who owns it? What's it all about? As the children begin to inhabit the world, they hear different stories about what it is, what it's all about. And they have to make judgments. I trust this one, not that one. Is Narnia really the realm of the White Witch? Or is it actually the kingdom that belongs to Aslan, who one day will return and inhabit and rule it? And you can see the, the children trying to, trying to work out, well, you know, there's, there's this, there's this, there's this, this makes sense of that, but not that. They're trying to work out who, which are the characters, and what, which story, to trust in making sense of Narnia. And imaginatively, it's very, very powerful. But the point that Lewis is making really is, look, in our own world, we are confronted with stories. They can't all be right. We have to work out which one is right. Are we simply random accidental products of a a mindless process and that's it? Or is there something deeper? Are we in some way the creation of a loving and caring God And we actually matter profoundly to that God. And what Lewis is really doing is, in effect, saying, look, in Narnia, this. In our own world, this. And thinking about Narnia helps us as we reflect on our own world as well. Now, the important point here is really that Lewis's Lewis's Narnia narrative is really a retelling of another story. And of course, as you all know, the story that Lewis is retelling is what we might call the Christian grand narrative. Creation, fall, redemption, final consummation, however you want to describe it. What Lewis is doing is saying that's the big story and the littler story of Narnia is a retelling of that in an imaginatively engaging way. I think Lewis was hoping that two things might happen. Number one, that readers of Narnia who were Christians would kind of begin to appreciate the intellectual depth and imaginative resonance of the Christian story. Very often, it's simply something we understand. Lewis is saying, look, we need to feel like what is to be part of this. We need to go deeper, to go further in, to use a phrase you find in Narnia. But also, of course, for those who are not Christians, reading this narrative, beginning to get a sense of what the underlying story behind Christianity is and why it might be engaging and why it might be transformative. And that, I think, is one of the points that we need to keep coming back to. Because in recent years, since about, I think, 1970, some might want to date a little bit later, there's been a massive rediscovery of the importance of stories. Um, We could draw a distinction, though I must emphasize we need to be careful about this, between modernity, that's about reason and argument, 
and postmodernity, which is about stories, images, in other words, moving us in a different direction. And Lewis is quite remarkable. Those of you who've read Mere Christianity will know he's quite good with arguments. But in Narnia, he's using images and stories. And the, the, one of the reasons that Lewis has proved so resilient is that he speaks both to modern and postmodern readerships. Indeed, I have friends who have moved from being modern to being postmodern, and C.S. Lewis has been their traveling companion as they moved. Uh, but the point is, Lewis doesn't say, look, I'm modern in this work, I'm postmodern in this. It's much more he gives us a holistic vision in which reason and imagination and narrative are integrated in such a way that we're able to hold together what otherwise might fall apart. Now, clearly, there's a lot more I could say about Narnia, and I will be very glad to talk about that later if you want me to. But I need to talk a bit more about Lewis the man. Uh, I never knew Lewis. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes me from writers like George Sayer is that he knew Lewis. And so something of what Lewis was like as a person comes through very powerfully in his writings. In my own case, I never met Lewis at all. You know, I, I encountered him at second hand through his writings. And therefore, I, I cannot really myself talk about what Lewis was like as a human being. What I can do is report on what is there in the historical evidence and also make a point which may strike you as surprising. But once you see it, I think you'll see why the approach I've adopted makes a lot of sense. In the 1930s, Lewis became involved in, uh, in a controversy with, with uh, E.M. Tilio de Cambridge over the relationship of an author and their books. And Lewis took the following position. It is not the author that matters. It is what they write. The important thing is books, writings, not the personality of the author behind them. And Lewis uses this phrase, which you may find helpful. The author, the writer, is not a spectacle to be looked at, but a set of spectacles to be looked through. That's Lewis's key point. And once you see that, then actually it gives you a new way of looking at how you write a biography of Lewis, because maybe Lewis would like to be remembered not for who he was as a human being, but for the books he writes and the new way of looking at things that he makes possible. And I think that's right. When you're thinking about Narnia, you can look at Narnia in two ways. You can kind of way, you know, it's like a guide to London. You can say, well, look, uh, let, let's wander around Narnia and see what it looks like. And, and you can do that, and there are lots of books that will help you do that. I personally think that is not what Lewis wanted you to do. He wanted you to see L Narnia not as something at which you look, but rather as something through which you look, and you see yourself, this world, in a different way. So I think one of the points I'm making is that in writing this biography as someone who did not know Lewis personally and is therefore really talking about what Lewis was trying to do, actually, you know, I think I may be honoring something quite important for Lewis himself. But nevertheless, we can't ignore the question, what was Lewis like as a human being? And the answer this biography gives is complex. Um, that, the, that there are things about Lewis I admire enormously and things I find puzzling. I don't really understand. I don't think anybody understands. What I'm going to do, if I may, is pick up on what I think is a weakness and what I think are some strengths as well, just to give you an idea of how complex Lewis is. Lewis, on the whole, isn't very good with women. Uh, relationally, and that became very clear in the 1950s, or indeed in rendering female characters in his novels. Narnia is dominated by male role models, but not exclusively so. Uh, again, this is something we might debate, but as I read Narnia, if there is a central character apart from Aslan, I think it's Lucy. So we need to be careful about this. But nevertheless, Lewis's writing, let's say late 40s, early 50s, in a very different world. 
And Lewis, remember, his mother died at a very early stage. He went to all boys schools. He went into the British Army. He went to all male colleges. I mean, what hope was there for him? You know, you know this, this, this was really very, very difficult. And in this biography, I flag up and I'm very positive about Lewis's relationship with Mrs. Moore, the mother of Paddy, who died in the First World War, who Lewis formed a relationship that we don't fully understand, but he stayed with her for the rest of her life. And I try to make the point that maybe Mrs. Moore helped Lewis develop social skills, in effect became more of a rounded personality. But I think it's important also to stress that Lewis actually is not a prisoner of his times. And there are points at which Lewis takes positions which I think are prophetic. I'm going to mention two of them. Number one, those of you who are well versed with the British cultural scene of the 1920s and 1930s will know that what we sometimes call the chattering classes were very into eugenics. Now many of you will say, what's that? And I'm glad if you are saying that because it shows that this has kind of way faded from memory. But in reality, in England in the 1920s, 1930s, the dominant view amongst the intellectual elite was, let us either prevent or make it difficult for socially undesirable people to have children, because they dilute the gene pool. Lewis was a vigorous critic of that. He saw it as simply inhumane. But more interestingly, and this will bring us back to Narnia, as you will see. Lewis also took a very strong position on vivisection. Again, vivisection was just the norm in Oxford scientific life, 1920s, 1930s. And Lewis lost many of his few scientific friends by saying, this is not acceptable. Lewis became an early critic of vivisection. His argument goes like this. We are above animals in the greater scheme of things. And that imposes obligations on us. We must treat them well. And that means we must see them in a different way. Again, think of someone like Iris Murdoch, the uh, philosopher of morality, who talks a lot about the way you see things having a decisive impact on the way you behave towards them. Lewis asks us to see animals as sentient creatures that need to be respected even when we use them in our own service. So you can see the link with Lanya immediately. Lewis was making this position very intensively in the late 1940s. The New England Anti-Vivisection Society reprinted some stuff he'd written as sort of a manifesto of anti-vivisectionism in the United States. In Narnia, animals are presented as sentient, thinking creatures who we almost feel we have a relationship with. I mean, think of Reaper Cheap. You know, I mean, you kind of get involved with Reaper Cheap, don't you? I mean, and, um, or Mr. Beaver. You know, it, the point Lewis is trying to do is to tell a story that makes us reevaluate the way we see things in our own world. I want to make the point that Lewis was way ahead of his time back in the 1940s. And so, yes, he's socially regressive, we might think, on some things, socially passive on others, but a prophet, a powerful prophet, even if a reluctant one, on others. So let me end, because I'm sure some of you will want to ask questions. I want to end by asking a question which I expect some of you will, will, will want me to reflect on, which is, did my opinion of Lewis change as a result of writing this biography? It's a fair question, because I have a friend who, who must remain nameless who began to write a biography of a certain person and gave it up, because what they were finding was so unsettling, they felt they just couldn't keep going, they didn't want to. I turned over many stones in writing this biography, and, and you will see some of them in the book itself. What emerged from me was Lewis as as a flawed human being, like all the rest of us, who was dealt a pretty bad hand in terms of his family situation and the historical circumstances in which he grew up. But actually, it's a story of someone who found his niche 
and then did what he think, thought had to be done. Lewis wanted to be a poet, as many of you will know. I don't think any of us now remember him as a poet at all. But the poetry he couldn't write in its own right, he was able to translate into prose, which kind of way has beautiful rhythm, elegant phrasing. So in effect, the poetry is there in the prose. What I want to say is I came away from writing this biography with an enhanced appreciation of Lewis. I realized all the more how difficult life had been for him. To give you one example only, the late 1940s, Mrs. Moore, who's still alive, is becoming demented. He lives with her in the house alongside his brother, Warney, who is now completely um, uh, addicted to alcohol, and he has to look after both of them. And, you know, you just sense the strain, you sense the exhaustion, and you genuinely feel sorry for him. So this book is written by someone who admires Lewis, who respects Lewis, but who also wants to tell the truth about Lewis. And my own view is the greatest compliment you can pay anyone is simply to say, here's the story, straight and simple, and in Lewis's case, it's interesting and inspiring as well. I hope you enjoy reading the book, but this is my final point. Lewis wrote a very good book in the early 1940s, 1942, called A Preface to Paradise Lost. And he saw it simply as a way of enabling the readers of that short book to approach Milton's Paradise Lost and get a lot more out of reading Milton as a result. This book is a preface to Lewis. I hope you'll find it interesting but the much more important thing is, I hope it will help you to engage with Lewis's writings. And I hope also you'll get a lot more out of reading those books as a result of this biography. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>Alistair, thank you very much indeed, and thank you as well for agreeing to take uh, questions now. And I wonder if I could start the ball rolling by asking, do you think that, we've, uh, that the church has professionalised Christian apologetics so much by doing mission and evangelism by the church, through the church, and in terms of the church, that it's much more difficult for us to discern people like C.S. Lewis, who discovered the rational and imaginative appeal of Christianity through and because of his literary interests? And are there, uh, would there otherwise be circles like the great Lewis, Tolkien, Sayers, uh, Eliot, Williams circles today if we were better at looking outside of ourselves? There is a sense in which um, the Inklings, people like Lewis, Tolkien, Charles Williams, were huddling together for warmth because they, they felt really they weren't appreciated, you know, that, the, that their ideas weren't really being picked up by other people. So I think there is that sense of that. And Lewis, I, told, I call him a reluctant prophet, mainly because he felt, look, there are other people who could do this better than me, but they don't seem to be doing it, or they don't seem to be doing it very well, so maybe I will just do it while they, you know, bide their time and then come in at a later date. So I do, I do sense that Lewis, um, Lewis has a personal manifesto for apologetics and to a lesser extent evangelism. And there's a sense in which today's church has professionalized that. Now I think that's a good thing because it means the church is taking engaging with questions that society raises very, very seriously. And Lewis, of course, is a very important resource in that process. The, the, the question I'd want to ask is, what are we doing to encourage new C.S. Lewis's to emerge? I'm not sure I've got the answer to that one. Well, you have, that's right. I mean, C.S. Lewis has, is a rock star uh, in the States, um, particularly, particularly amongst evangelicals and Catholics. Uh, and I think you can begin to understand why that is. But when I say understand, it means really, now that it has happened, we can kind of make sense of it, 
But nobody could have predicted that back in the 1960s. Lewis was seen as a slightly strange figure by most Americans. He uh, smoked a pipe, he drank. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he just really didn't fit quite with the American image of a clean living, clean thinking person. I think there are a number of things here which do help us, though. One of them is simply that um, Americans have always, and I personally am very grateful for this, but they've always had this sense that Oxford and to a lesser extent Cambridge are iconic. You know, you've, you've got Cambridge and Massachusetts, you haven't got Oxford. And, and therefore, the Oxford kind of has a mystique. Tolkien and Lewis are both Oxford people. So that might be part of the mix. The other thing I would say is this. Um, many Americans take the Christianity much more seriously than their British counterparts. Uh, you know, if you, at American churches, you have adult Sunday schools. You know, these, these things are taken very, very seriously. And Lewis is seen as somebody who is orthodox, who writes extremely well, who is someone you can engage with, both at the level of reasoned argument, mere Christianity, or at imaginative engagement, Narnia. And that actually means that it's not just that Lewis says some good things. He says them rather well. And so both those things together, I think, do secure his arguments. But I think the, the final point to make is just there is always a sense of a prophet being without honor in his own nation. And I, I think that, um, the, I mean, Lewis is very well known here in the UK. And, um, you know, the, 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 nobody is dishonoring him. It's just he's not given the same estimation as in the United States. So you're right. And maybe what I've sketched helps understand that. But to me, the difference, you're right, is very, very striking. Thank you. He references Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, he does. There are a whole lot of cases like that, where again, prominent people came to faith because of Lewis, or Lewis was in the mix somewhere. And again, people began to read Lewis because they saw this guy's talking about him. Let, let's do that. So you're quite right. Another factor, of course, is that uh, Carl Henry tried to get Lewis to do some apologetic writings from mere Christ for. Um, Christianity today, Lewis wouldn't do it, but again, signs of a growing realization this guy might be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, the, the first point to emphasize is that Lewis's conversion to theism and Christianity actually is deeply linked with his study of literature. You know, it's not just thinking ideas. One of the things Lewis talks about is the quality of the rendering of reality he sees in writings, writers like George Bernard Shaw on the one hand and George Herbert on the other. And he says, you know, he used the word mythology, he says you know, that Christian mythology seems rather good at giving a a deeply textured account of reality. And that, I think, is quite indicative. Lewis is clearly saying to himself, this, 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 this isn't right, but it, it actually it does have some very good outcomes. So that's part of the deal. But I think that the main thing is not so much Lewis's conversion to belief in God, but his conversion to Christianity. Now, there's a debate about this, but, but suppose we agree that a conversation with Tolkien late one night in September 1931, as they walked around Addison's Walk in the gathering gloom with a wind blowing leaves around. Think of John chapter 3. You know, I, I mean, you know, there Tolkien talks to him about the transformative power of myth. Now, myth not as story told to deceive, but myth as a, a story that resonates with the deepest human intuitions, which captures our imaginations and conveys ideas. And what Lewis realized was that, well, I think there are two things. One is that if Christianity is a true myth, then that makes a lot of sense of Christianity, but makes sense of the pagan myths I love as well. And he suddenly realized it wasn't a question of either, you know, walk, turning my back on classic culture and embracing Christianity, but embracing Christianity, and as a result, being able to see that in its proper light and do good things with it. And that was transformative form. But the other thing is, I could be a storyteller 
who retells the Christian story. Now, both Lewis and Tolkien did that in their own way. And you may have read a little poem that Tolkien seems to have written as a sort of memory of that conversation with Lewis. It's called Mythopoeia. And in it, he talks about, um, we still create according to the way in which we're made. In other words, the uh, early Christian writers talked about logos spermaticos, meaning a sort of seed-bearing word God planted in creation. It's almost as if Lewis is talking about a mythos spermaticos, a seed-bearing story deeply implanted within things of which Christianity is the, the final, ultimate, and best retelling. So there's a huge amount there. And I would say that Lewis's literary vision was enriched by Christianity. And we see that outcome partly in Narnia, but also, I think, just in the way in which he began to realize that the importance of telling stories for making sense of things. Thank you. I'm sure there is. Um, Lewis frequently emphasized how much he owed to G.K. Chesterton, especially his book, The Everlasting Man. And indeed, I, I would personally say that I, I'm, I'm sure Chesterton's apologetic writings were an inspiration for Lewis. The real danger is, I think, if you've read Lewis and then read G.K. Chesterton's books, for example, Orthodox of the Everlasting Man, you kind of feel you're, you're turning to something that's not quite as good. And the real problem is that, that, you know, that Chesterton actually is very good. It's just that Lewis is better. And so inevitably, you know, we, we've kind of way devalued Chesterton as a result. But Chesterton was very important for Lewis. And Father Brown. Well, yes. But not just Chesterton and Father Brown, but um, Dorothy L. Sayers and Lord Peter Whimsey. There, there's a tradition began to emerge in the 1930s of writers such as Sayers and Chesterton, in effect, using their faith to tell stories which embedded Christian ideas. And that's especially clear towards the end of the Peter Whimsey series, because that's really when uh, Dorothy Sayers becomes deeply engaged with her faith. So the answer is I'm sure that Lewis has noted the importance of the Father Brown stories. I don't myself see him mimicking their style, but the general principle, we can use stories to do apologetics. That's deeply embedded in Lewis's thought. That's a very good question. Um, why did Lewis stay a member of the Church of England? I think the answer is because he had this deep sense of an order of things. He talks about this in his book, The Discarded Image. And he saw the parish system as a very important embodiment of that. He talks about this in Screwtape, the Screwtape Letters. And it's almost as if he feels that um, he is under an obligation to become involved with local enactments of Christianity. So think about it. He begins going to his college chapel. That's Anglican by statute. He then also begins to attend his local parish church. Not, let me shop around, but I'm going to my local parish church. And uh, there are passages in some of his letters which suggest he didn't entirely find that a, always a happy experience. Um, uh, but, um, but nevertheless, he, he felt it was a very important expression of being a Christian. Of being a Christian. For me, the really interesting question would, would be this. Supposing Lewis did not go to Oxford as an undergraduate, but had gone to one of the great Scottish universities and discovered God there. And again, you know, there's so many ifs and maybes here, but supposing he had, in effect, become a Christian with the same set of ideas in a context where Anglicanism did not have the same social identity. Would he have become a member of the Church of Scotland? I don't know. But it's a nice little experiment to try and do in your mind. What I would say is that, that Lewis was proud to describe himself as a layman of the Church of England. And he never backtracked on that. Uh, he's buried in Oxford in his local parish church cemetery. You can go and see the grave. It's, very, it's a very significant tourist site. But the main point is that Lewis, Lewis saw himself as being an advocate, not of Anglicanism, of something he held lay behind Anglicanism. Uh, and that was this, this famous idea of mere Christianity. And his point is, look, look, this is how I see Christianity. I'm perfectly happy with this. I realize there are others who see things in different ways. This is how I see it, 
I thought, I'm going to live out my Christian life, but I am not an apologist for the Church of England. I'm an apologist for something that's deeper than that. Thank you. Yes, I think that that is very important. Um, thank you for that. Um, there's a letter that Lewis wrote um, to Arthur Greaves saying, as you and I both know, one of the best ways of coping with very difficult things is to write them down. You know, and, and, and Lewis seems to have seen um, writing as a way of dealing with things. And that's certainly true of The Grief Observed, which, um, as you rightly say, was published in 1961 under a pseudonym. Um, and that, that book is very significant. I mean, I mean, Lewis had written earlier on pain. In 1940, he wrote The Problem of Pain. It's an over-intellectualized account of pain. It's not bad at all. It's, it's quite good. But it tends to treat pain as an intellectual puzzle, uh, rather than something as existentially distressing. And the death of his wife, Joy Davidman, clearly shook Lewis very, very significantly. And he wrote what I would have to describe as a journal of his feelings, uh, which were raw and uncensored. And in fact, in a, in a letter to a friend of his afterwards, he said, you know, I, I explored every option. You know, in other words, he said, what if God were a tormentor? What if there is no God? In other words, he worked through every option, and it's raw. And it's actually quite unsettling to read. And obviously, he, he works it all through. If, if, if you watch the movie Shadowlands, you have the impression perhaps Lewis ends up being an unbelieving humanist, but that isn't actually what happened, as you will know. But it's very important, because I think it, it really shows that Lewis was, was someone who had feelings. I mean, you know, he, he's a man, and perhaps in that cultural location, it wasn't seen as appropriate to express those emotions. Maybe that helps understand why he used a pseudonym. But it's a very raw account of what it's like to be bereaved, and also how, how initially he doesn't want to make sense of it. He just wants to, to, you know, to, to get through it. And then afterwards begins to look back and try and make sense of it. So I think there are two points there. One, why a pseudonym? Well, I think it was to protect the innocent, to be honest with you. Uh, he published it with a publisher he didn't normally use, Faber and Faber. He normally used um, Jeffrey Bless or someone like that. Uh, and he initially used the pseudonym Demidius, a Latin word which means divided in half. The publishing director of um, Faber and Faber at that time was T.S. Eliot. And T.S. Eliot thought, who on earth would use such a sophisticated literary pseudonym as that? I know who it is. And so, <laughs> so he just wrote back and said um, to, in effect, Lewis's agent at that time, the author, whoever he is, might well find it better to disguise himself more efficiently by using a less literary um, pseudonym. And of course, he ch changed it. As you probably know, um, some of Lewis's friends read this book and thought, this is a very good account of grief. Lewis, you must read this. You know, it, it will help you. Uh, Alistair, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your enormous enthusiasm, which comes across in the book, but which you've also articulated so beautifully to us this afternoon. Uh, so please, could we... I, I've got some plugs to do in a moment, but first of all, could we give a huge round of applause and express our thanks?